Good morning, everyone. My name is Professor Claire Johnson, Director of Australian Catholic University's Centre for Liturgy, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you to this public lecture. This welcome extends to everyone joining us from a wide variety of countries in our region, including Samoa, Fiji, the Cook Islands, the Philippines, Malaysia, New Zealand, and people from all over Australia and further afield from the USA, England, and Italy. What a wonderful world we live in that over 200 people from so many different places can gather together for such an event. Prior to the onset of the COVID-19 global pandemic, ACU had invited our esteemed guest lecturer to come to Australia to deliver a master's level class for ACU, some formation days for clergy and Australian diocese, and to offer this public lecture in various locations. While we're very sorry not to have been able to facilitate his travel to Australia on this occasion, we are so grateful that he has graciously agreed to deliver his lecture to us via Zoom. As we emerge from a period of ecclesiastical frostiness regarding the prospect of more formally embracing the incorporation of culturally diverse elements into the official liturgical celebrations of the Roman Catholic Church, signs of new life have begun to appear under the papacy of Pope Francis. Signalling the possibility of a new approach to the relationship between liturgy and culture as early as 2013, in Evangelii Gaudium 27, Pope Francis said, I dream of a missionary option that is a missionary impulse capable of transforming everything so that the church's customs, ways of doing things, times and schedules, language and structures can be suitably channeled for the evangelization of today's world rather than for his her self-preservation. Pope Francis's fresh view of the importance of culture, both in the church broadly and in its liturgy in particular, demands further investigation and close study. And we have with us today, someone eminently capable of providing great insights into what the future of the liturgy culture dynamic under Pope Francis might be. So now it is my privilege to formally introduce our distinguished guest lecturer, Reverend Professor Mark R. Francis, CSV. A diverse background in ministerial formation and teaching in many different cultural contexts has enriched and expanded Mark Francis's distinguished academic career. His time as chaplain and formation director in Bogota, Colombia, as a newly ordained priest, provided rich experiences which shaped his view on the importance of understanding and exploring the link between liturgy and diverse cultures. Mark's innate understanding of the nature of liturgical prayer grew during his time as a member of the Revision and Translation Subcommittee of the International Commission on English in the Liturgy from 1992 to 2000. And his understanding of the nature of diverse cultures expanded further during his time as International Superior General of his religious order, the clerics of St. Viator or the Viatorians. Since 2013, Mark has been leading the Catholic Theological Union at Chicago as its president, while continuing to teach, research, and publish in his various areas of expertise, liturgy and culture, multicultural liturgies, and more recently, intercultural liturgies. And now with virtual applause, as he joins us live from Chicago, where it is Sunday night, I invite you to join me in welcoming Professor Mark Francis to deliver his lecture titled, The Challenge of Intercultural Liturgy in the Era of Pope Francis. Welcome, Mark. But in the change of an epic. The old structures that shored up what we thought it meant to be Catholic have grown increasingly weaker and in some cases have fallen away altogether. I don't need to tell you in Australia or in other places in the world about the soul searching and reevaluation that have been done recently regarding very basic questions about the nature of the church and how it should function, all provoked by the clerical sexual abuse crisis. Just the title of the report commissioned by the Australian bishops the Light from the Southern Cross, Promoting Co-Responsible Governance in the Catholic Church in Australia, could not have been imaginable even 10 years ago. At no time since the Second Vatican Council have issues such as decentralization, shared governance uh, in church matters, and a critique of clericalism been on the table as they are today. 
In large part, this change has taken place because of the extraordinary shift in emphasis in thinking about the church brought on by the new seven-year pontificate of, of Pope Francis. This change has necessarily refocused our approach to liturgy, since a good way of understanding liturgy itself is enacted ecclesiology. How we worship, we believe we are expressing the church. While there are many facets of this change, I'll, I'll focus on the way Pope Francis has promoted a new liturgical era, not only through his official pronouncements, but perhaps even more importantly, through his use of dramatic symbols that communicate a new vision for the church in our globalized world. In some ways though, this is surprising. After all, Jorge Bergoglio, Pope Francis, is a Jesuit. I don't know if we have any Jesuits with us here tonight, but don't worry, it won't be too, too critical. But, and Jesuits though, are not known for the liturgical focus. While there are many very accomplished Jesuits trained in the field of liturgy, the company of Jesus as a whole has never seen liturgy as a distinctive part of its charism. About 20 years ago, I was invited to be an honorary member of the Jesuits Jungmann Society, named after the great Jesuit liturgical historian, Josef Jungmann. At the time, I was superior general of my religious community, and at a meeting with other superiors general, Father Hans-Peter Kolvenbach, the late Jesuit father general, known for his very wry sense of humor, was also present. I mentioned to him that I had been asked to join this Jesuit liturgical group. And with a mischievous grin, he said, ah, yes, a Jesuit liturgical group. Sounds kind of oxymoronic, doesn't it? Now the late Bob Taft, the eminent Jesuit scholar of Eastern liturgies, even used this quip as a title for an article in Worship Magazine, Jesuit liturgy, an oxymoron? But in order to appreciate the real shift that has taken place under Pope Francis in the way that the current magisterium is dealing with the relationship of culture and liturgy, it's helpful to look at the way curia authorities in the preceding two pontificates uh, regarded liturgical renewal. In many ways, they reverted to a preconciliar understanding of worship as essentially ceremonies governed more by rubrics than by the human context in which they are celebrated. This attitude went hand in hand with a turn toward a centralization of control over liturgy by the Roman Congregation for Divine Worship and Discipline of the Sacraments. Prior to Vatican II, the so-called Tridentine liturgy was regulated by the central authority of the Roman Curia. And for example, the Roman Missal promulgated by Pope Pius V in 1570 established exactly how the mass of the Roman rite was to be celebrated through detailed rubrics enforced under pain of sin. While there existed variations of the Roman rite of mass, for example, local Gallic and or French rites, the rites of several religious orders like the Dominicans and Carthusians, aside from these exceptions, the standardization of liturgical practice in the Western church was made possible by the relatively new invention of the printing press. Some of you more mature Catholics, I say more mature now rather than old, I'm trying to get diplomatic in my old age. Uh, so some of you more mature Catholics will remember that with pride, Catholics used to say that you could go anywhere in the world and the mass would be celebrated exactly the same way, modeling a unity of belief and communion that extended around the globe. But this was true only up to a point. While the words and ritual gestures of the priest and servers were meticulously prescribed, what surrounded the central core of the celebration, music, architecture, popular religious custom, varied greatly from place to place. Nonetheless, prior to Vatican II, liturgical unity, at least as it's concerned, uh, it is a concern the clerical celebrants, was considered an absolute value that was enforced by Roman authority because it represented orthodoxy and ecclesial unity. 
With the promulgation in 1963 of Sacrosanctum Concilium, the Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy, unity was no longer linked to uniformity. And this is in Article 37 of the Constitution. Local cultural liturgical differences were now recognized as not only permitted, but an important way of helping to make the celebration accessible to people of a bewildering variety of cultures that make up the world church, to use a phrase coined by Karl Rahner. The Constitution authorized legitimate variation and adaptation of a simplified Roman Missal to different groups, regions, and peoples, provided the substantial unity of the Roman Rite was preserved. The Constitution gave the responsibility for translations of the liturgy from the Latin editio typica to the vernacular. They gave this responsibility to the National Bishops' Conferences. But immediately after the promulgation of the uh, liturgy constitution, forces in the Roman Curia were already at work to wrest back control over the liturgy from local bishops' conferences. The motu proprio sacra liturgy of January the 30th, 1964, in part prepared by the Roman Congregation for Rites, appeared in Observatore Romano and specified in contradiction to the Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy, that the Roman Curia has the authority to approve, not just confirm, liturgical translations. Within days, the French bishop sent a strong letter to the Concilium, the, the group charged with implementing the liturgical changes of Vatican II, protesting this departure from the intention of the bishops of Vatican II and the Liturgy Constitution. But this move was to herald the beginning of the Roman Curia's ongoing attempts to undo the decentralizing structural reforms set forth in the documents of the Second Vatican Council. The battle would last up to the present day and Pope Francis's pontificate. The details of the first part of the sad story are recounted in 2007 by Archbishop Piero Marini in his book, on the early period of liturgical renewal after the council called A Challenging Reform. I had the privilege of being one of the English editors for the English version of this book. And uh, it was an eye opener, especially the, uh, the independent letters from uh, the National Bishops Conferences to, uh, to the Vatican at this time. Now, despite the unease with the decentralization set in motion by the council on the part of curial officials, Important experiences of inculturation were launched in the 1970s and 1980s during the pontificate of Paul VI and the early years of John Paul II's pontificate. One of the most notable efforts at liturgical inculturation since the council was the adaptation of the Roman Rite of Mass for the Diocese of Zaire, today's Democratic Republic of the Congo. This particular version of the Roman Rite was proposed to the Holy See after extensive study by pastors, theologians, and anthropologists. And experimentations began in 1969. And this variation on the Roman Rite was finally approved by 1988, in 1988 by the Congregation for Worship in Rome. The call for cultural adaptation of the liturgy enunciated by Vatican II was enthusiastically embraced in India as well soon after the end of the council. In, 19, in 1966 and 1967, the Catholic Bishops' Conference of India set the liturgical reform in motion by establishing the National Biblical, Catechetical, and Liturgical Center. The center produced a proposal for areas of liturgical enculturation that were endorsed by the Indian bishops, who then sent the document that was approved, then approved by the concilium. In the Philippines, led by Father Ansgar Chapungo, a uh, Filipino, uh, Benedictine, he can be, later became the, uh, uh, the president of San Anselmo and my mentor. Uh, in, uh, in this Filipino expression of the Roman rite was developed called the Missa Nabayang Filipino. After several years of work on this project that involved liturgists, 
theologians, pastors, sociologists, cultural anthropologists, and experts in linguistics. The Missa Nabayan Filipino was reviewed by an ad hoc committee of bishops, and in 1976, it was unanimously approved by the Conference of Catholic Bishops of the Philippines and submitted for confirmation to the Congregation for Divine Worship. To date, however, no approval has been forthcoming. It's languished on the desk of the Vatican since 1976. In 1994, the Roman Congregation for Worship issued the instruction, the Roman Rite and Enculturation, Latin title is Veritatis Legitime, interpret, interpreting Sacrosanctum Concilium 37 and to 40, and further specifies the nature of liturgical enculturation. This document defines enculturation, and I quote, as an intimate transformation of authentic cultural values by their integration into Christianity and the implantation of Christianity into different human cultures. And the document insisted that the word enculturation is more appropriate than the word adaptation for this transformation. But in a move that seems to reflect the real hesitation on the part of the Roman authorities regarding enculturation, the document itself, this Varietatis Legitime, reverts to speaking about adaptation rather than enculturation in the last section that offers little more than superficial examples of the various facets of the liturgy that could be the object of enculturation. There's always two minds expressed in Roman documents, and you can read them in between, in, in between the various lines. What they give in one hand, sometimes they take away with the other. Now this hesitancy and even reticence to enculturation only grew stronger in the 1990s and the 2000s. The Roman Curia's rejection of the 1998 translation of the Missal by the International Commission on English and the Liturgy, ISIL. Uh, now this was a translation and in, in, in full uh, uh, revelation here, I was part of this translation. Uh, it had been approved by all the English speaking bishops conferences, uh, but its rejection seemed to draw a line in the sand. The translation used inclusive language. It used a dynamic equivalent approach to translation. So we weren't translating simply word from word to word and, and use, translating the, the, the Latin syntax necessarily. And this translation also proposed original texts, original collects, inspired by reflecting uh, the gospel readings from the Sunday lectionary. Now, these were opening prayers that hadn't been translated from the Latin. And it was an initiative that had been invited by the previous document on liturgical translation, uh, Come le Prévois, back in 1969. But now it was roundly sidelined by the Roman Congregation of Worship under the direction of Chilean Cardinal Jorge Medina. With the publication of a new document on translation that took the place of this previous one, Liturgium Authenticum in 2001, uh, produced by the Congregation of Worship with little consultation of scholars and translators, and the promulgation of the Editio Typica Tertia, the third edition of the Roman Missal in 2002, a pall fell over projects for enculturation. In addition to the general instruction on the Roman Missal, number 398, if you wanna look it up, uh, composed, this particular section was composed for this third uh, typical edition, expressed the skepticism of the curial authorities regarding efforts to change the received Roman rite in order to make it more accessible to different cultures. And I quote, enculturation requires a necessary amount of time, lest in a hasty and incautious manner, the authentic liturgical tradition suffer contamination. Contamination. They evidently saw that attempts at enculturation risked opening up the pure Roman rite to some kind of deformation or contagion, a kind of a liturgical COVID, I guess. 
This attitude is, a very diff is very different from what is reflected in Article 37 of the Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy that counsels against a rigid uniformity in matters that do not affect the faith or the good of the whole of the community. The Congregation for Worship now regarded the Roman Rite in and of itself as culturally universal and an object to be protected against any kind of change. In the addition to the new 2011 English translation of the Roman Missal, that scrupulously translates every Latin word of the Editio Typica. Perhaps no statement speaks more profoundly of the previous Roman attitude toward liturgical enculturation than Benedict XVI Sumorum Pontificum in 2007. This motu proprio allows for the more widespread use of the Tridentine Rite of the Mass and controversially contends that this rite, this Tridentine rite, was not abrogated by the publication of the new liturgical books mandated by the Second Vatican Council and promulgated by Pope Paul VI. Now, much ink has been spilled in both defending and deploring the designation of the Tridentine rite as the extraordinary rite. But it's clear that the emergence of two very contrasting liturgical practices that express very different theologies of church has placed the Roman rite in a rather anomalous position. It's also encouraged a mentality that wishes to turn back the clock to before the reforms of the Second Vatican Council, restoring liturgical celebrations more reflective of the 16th than the 21st century. It was into this atmosphere of liturgical confusion and stagnation that Pope Francis came on the scene. It's well known that Pope Francis speaks through symbolic gestures. One of the first indications that business as usual was coming to an end uh, with this new Pope was at his initial appearance on the loggia of St. Peter's Basilica when he bowed to the throng assembled in the square and asked them to bless him. Rather than the traditional and hierarchical one-way blessing of the Pope to the world, his humble request for the people's blessing first spoke of a mutuality and respect of the current pontiff for the everyday Christian believers. And in Spanish, he reverts to this phrase constantly, the pueblo santo y fiel, the holy and faithful common people. Now, even before this moment, the so, in the so-called Room of Tears adjoining the Sistine Chapel, uh, when being dressed for the first time by the Papal Master of Ceremonies in the white papal cassock, Francis was offered the mozetta, a short red cape, and you can see them on the slide there, and a elaborate stole, along with the traditional red shoes. You can see those at the bottom of the slide. Uh, they, they supposedly were, were made by Prada. I'm not sure if that's true, but that's supposedly. Now, this may be an apocryphal story, but there were reports that he turned down these vestments with the phrase, il carnavale è finito, Mardi Gras is over. While he did wear the stole later when giving the solemn blessing to the people, he reputedly was making the point that this papacy was going to be simpler, less Baroque than that of his predecessor. His choice to live in the Casa Santa Marta in a simple suite of rook, taking his meals in the dining room with other residents rather than in the apostolic palace illustrated his desire to do away with the Renaissance court that had traditionally surrounded the Pope. I remember Cardinal Tagle telling me the story that he was visiting Santa Marta and he was there in the, in the, in the cafeteria dining room kind of thing in, in there. And there he saw the Pope all alone at a table. And so he said, well, no one wants to sit with him. This is kind of sick. Of course, no one knew what to do because it was a new kind of thing. So he got up from the table and he went over and said, uh, Holy Father, may I join you for dinner? And he looked up and he said, of course, Holy Son, sit down. 
this is a whole different attitude than, than had been uh, prevalent before. Now his preference from the beginning of his time as Pope to be driven around Rome, not in the usual Mercedes sedan, but in a Ford Focus, also underlines the new, simpler, more humble image he wants to project. These choices, pardon me, these choices speak volumes and were an indication of a decided change of atmosphere that would also be expressed by means of his liturgical style. Now I, I have here a car, I, I lived in Rome for 12 years. So these are kinds of things you, you learn. And here, this is a car, this is a Mercedes Benz, you see on the slide and it has license plates. And you know right away that, the, that it's from the Vatican. And you know that because the license plate begins SCV, which stands for Stato Città del Vaticano, the Vatican City State. Now, Romans who are world weary and have seen it all say, no, it really doesn't mean uh, Stato Città del Vaticano. What it really means is, se Cristo videsse, if Christ could see this. I'd like to share with you a very short video here. The sound isn't that important, but it was from the early part of Pope's pontificate. He was visiting the south, southern part of Italy, a place called Sibari, and uh, people lined the, they knew he was coming by in his Ford Focus and people lined the streets. And this was something that was an extraordinary experience that kind of hark back to uh, who the Italians call it Papo Buono, Pope John the 23rd. But I'll just, I'll, I won't comment on it, I'll just let you watch it. The Italians are so understated in their expression of emotion, aren't they? Anyway, uh, the first Holy Week that the Pope celebrated uh, in Rome as Pope, uh, as Pope Francis, uh, on Monday, th Monday, Thursday, he decided to preside at Mass at the Casal del Marmo, a ju juvenile deten detention center, rather than at St. John Lateran. There he washed and kissed, kissed the feet of 12 young detainees, among whom was a Muslim girl. The fact that he elected to celebrate this mass outside the cathedral and wash the feet of both men and women, as well as non-Catholics, was hailed by many as an inspiring outreach to those on the margins and an attempt to be more inclusive or intercultural. Others roundly criticized the Pope for not following the rubrics of the Roman Missal that specified that the celebrant is to wash the feet of 12 men who are supposed to represent the 12 apostles who were all men. While it's true that the rubrics did specify men, for years in Latin America, the United States, and most probably Australia, the custom has been for people of both sexes to be accepted as recipients of the foot washing. In his first apostolic exhortation, The Joy of the Gospel, Francis may have had some of these critics in mind when he wrote, I quote, in some people we see an ostentatious preoccupation for the liturgy, for doctrine, and for the church's prestige, 
but without any concern that the gospel have a real impact on God's faithful people and the concrete needs of the present time. In this way, the life of the church turns into a museum piece or something which is the property of a select few. Now, two and a half years later, in January of 2016, after direct orders from the Pope, the Congregation for Worship finally published a decree allowing females as well as males to have their feet washed on Holy Thursday. Cardinal Robert Sarra, the conservative prefect of the congregation, was obviously dragging his feet in publishing this decree. However, he didn't seem to count on the tenacity of the Pope in making sure that the rubric was finally changed. Another significant change made by, the, by Pope Francis was in the manner that archbishops received the insignia of their office. The pallium, a band of white wool worn over the shoulders to indicate that the wearer is an archbishop with a certain authority over a group of dioceses. Uh, it's the metropolitan of it called technically a metropolitan of an ecclesiastical province. Uh, in the past, the, the palia or palliums were blessed and personally placed by the Pope on the shoulders of the new archbishops on the feasts of Peter and Paul, June the 29th in Rome. In 2014, Pope Francis changed the procedure. Rather than placing it on the shoulders of each archbishop, he now simply blesses the pallium, palliums and presents them to each prelate for them to take back to their archdiocese and have it conferred on them by the apostolic nuncio. This change is significant because it emphasizes that they are ex exercising their authority locally. This responsibility is symbolically enacted when they are in their own diocese. Bishops are not merely a franchisee of the Pope, but have proper authority that needs to be respected. While many people may not appreciate the symbolism, what Pope Francis is saying about decentralization of authority by this change of procedure is unmistakable. And in a clear and forceful talk given to the participants during the 68th National Italian Liturgical Week on August 24, 2017, Pope Francis unequivocally affirmed his support for the changes in the liturgy set in motion by Vatican II. And he said this, we can affirm with certainty and with magisterial authority that the liturgical reform is irreversible. Ten days later, in the Modo Proprio Magnum Principium, dated September the 3rd, 2017, the Pope explicitly legislated what the conciliar bishops at Vatican II outlined in paragraph 36 of the Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy. In other words, that the National Bishops' Conferences were to be primarily responsible for liturgical translations. Both of these documents, one pastoral and the other legal, show beyond any doubt Pope Francis's support for the renewed vision of the church found in the council's documents and enacted in the Reformed liturgy. As we discussed earlier, the council's move to decentralize liturgical authority, placing responsibility for producing translations of the Editionis Tipice in vernacular languages to national bishops' conferences, was opposed by forces in the Roman Congregation for Worship in 1964. This opposition only became more entrenched with the issu issuance of Litur Liturgia Authenticum in 2001 and the publication of the third edition of the Roman Missal. But in both his speech, his speech to the Liturgical Week's participants and in his motu proprio, the Pope has restored the Council's original intention to decentralize control over the liturgy that had been thwarted since 1964. In this context of controversy, Pope Francis makes clear the abiding importance of the liturgical reforms of Vatican II, at one moment to a group of pastoral liturgists, and then to the whole church in the form of a motu proprio, reaffirming a crucial element of this reform. To the liturgists, he makes clear that two inextricably related events, the council 
and the liturgical reform did not unexpectedly arise, but were prepared over a long period of time. Interestingly, the Holy Father describes this preparation before the Council as a kind of dialogue between the liturgical movement and the popes of the 20th century. He noted that it was a liturgical movement that had pointed out the disagi or the problems encountered in the prayer of the church and that the popes had provided answers or set in motion solution to these problems. These actions, states Pope Francis, enabled the Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy to, quote, respond to the real needs and to the concrete hope of renewal and produce a living liturgy for a church made completely alive by the mysteries celebrated, unquote. It is in this context that he speaks of the church at prayer, bringing together all those who attentively listen to the gospel without excluding anyone, the small and the great, the rich and the poor, young and the old, healthy and sick, and the just and sinners. It is also for this reason that since the liturgy brings together the entire people of God, popular religious practices must also be respected. Rather than being an elite activity, the liturgy needs to be able to welcome the practice of popular piety. Taking up this theme, explained in greater length than Evangelii Gaudium, Pope Francis urges, we ought not to forget that it is especially for the liturgy to express the pietas or the piety of all the people of God, prolonged then by the pious exercises and devotions that we know with the, saint, the name popular piety to be valued and encouraged in harmony with the liturgy. The emphasis on the popular nature of the liturgy is Pope Francis' particular contribution, which is largely based on his background as a bishop from Latin America, where popular piety has kept the faith alive for centuries, despite the lack of clergy. His sensitivity to popular piety helps to balance the unease uh, members of the liturgical movement offer often expressed in regard to popular devotions, which were considered by them too individualistic and uncomfortably uh, close to superstition. While the Constitution on the Liturgy number 13 insisted that devotions should be so fashioned that they harmonize with the liturgical seasons, accord with the sacred liturgy, and are in some way derived from it and lead people to it, since in fact the liturgy by its very nature surpasses any of them, local bishops have always realized the importance of popular piety, especially in Latin America. The 1994 instruction from the Congregation for Divine Worship on Liturgical Enculturation, uh, the Varitatis Legitime, seemed to establish, though, a wall that could not be crossed between popular devotions and liturgy. The Congregation's 2002 Directory on Popular Piety and the Liturgy, while more positive as to the influence of popular piety, maintains what it considered a clear division between what is liturgical or official and what is popular piety unofficial. But this, suppo this supposed clear division is not always easy to see. In the years after the council, especially in the declarations of the Latin American bishops conferences, Salem, the topic of popular piety was treated much more sympathetically. Because of his conviction that the faith is expressed by the holy, faithful people of God in a way that larger, the larger church needs to consider more seriously, Pope Francis envisions a more symbiotic relationship between popular religious practice and the liturgy. It is this relationship that opens the door to enculturation. It is also this kind of relationship that can be best judged by national bishops' conferences rather than by curial officials in Rome. And the Pope wrote that popular piety enables us to see how the faith, once received, becomes embodied in a culture and is constantly passed on. Once looked down upon, popular piety came to be appreciated once more in the decades following the council. This is what he wrote in Evangelii Gaudium. Now, with characteristic humility, the Pope introduces 
his post-synodal exhortation, Carita Amazonia, uh, as simply a presentation of the final document of the Synod on the Amazon. And he encourages people to read that, that, that final uh, synodal document. And he writes, this, this document profited from the participation of many people who know better than myself or the Roman Curia the problems and issues of the Amazon region, Quote, unquote. The Holy Father is alluding here to the extraordinary way this particular synod was prepared. And it's a way that reflects this new vision of church the Pope is proposing. The working document or instrumentum laboris for the Amazon Synod is the fruit of an amazing amount of consultation through the, uh, the, called, the thing called the, uh, the REPAM, the Red Ecclesial Panam Mosonica. It's an organization uh, of all of the countries in the Amazon region. The church's network uh, that promotes the rights and dignity of people living in the Amazon. Nine countries belong to this network. Bolivia, Brazil, Colombia, Ecuador, French Guyana, Guyana, Peru, Suriname, and Venezuela. These consultations got underway just after Pope Francis's announcement of the Synod uh, at his 2017 visit to a place called Puerto Maldonado in Peru. Now, according to uh, the director of this, uh, this network, these consultations took the form of territorial assemblies and meetings of between 80 and 200 people comprised of 150 indigenous nationalities, surveys and discussions around 40 thematic forums, and countless meetings with leaders and pastoral agents. It's been estimated that in all some 64,000 people were consulted including almost all the bishops in the Amazon. This represents an unprecedented con uh, consultation for a bishop synod that for the first time intentionally included the Pueblo Santo y Fiel, the holy common people of God, the grassroots people so dear to the Pope's heart. Now during the course of the synod, the Pope obviously listened in some ways the complex mix of cultures, languages, and tribes in the Amazon serves as a kind of microcosm of the entire world church. The call for interculturality voiced time and again in the discussions of the Synod in its final document and in the Pope's exhortation serves as a model that he envisions for the entire church. Just as the various cultures of the Amazon, each with its distinct genius and history, are called upon to be in dialogue with one another and learn from each other how they have particularly enculturated the gospel. This process is one that belongs to the synodal church that the Pope has in mind. While attentive to the traditions brought by missionaries in past centuries, the variegated and culturally rich region has been invited to explore a process of making the gospel accessible to its people through church structures and liturgical celebrations that also spring from the local culture. An illustration of this concern is the way the final synod document handles the question of opening the priesthood to married men. Significantly, mention of this possibility is not found in the discussion on ministry, but in its reflection on the importance of the Eucharist. Due to the vast open territories in the Amazon and the lack of priests, it is not unusual for smaller communities to be deprived of the Eucharist for months, even years. The document makes a call to come to a solution to this problem, since Christian communities have a right to the Eucharist because its celebration constitutes an essential characteristic of being church. After careful acknowledgement of the positive aspects of the celibate priesthood in the Latin church, this final synod document calls for the ordination of suitable and respected men of the community with a legitimately constituted and stable family who have had a fruitful permanent diaconate. In his reflection on this topic, later in his own exhortation, the Pope places the real problem of the lack of priests in the context of the Eucharist, much like the final document did. And he wrote, in the specific circumstances of the Amazon region, 
particularly in its forests and more remote places, a way must be found to ensure priestly ministry. The laity can produce God's word, teach, organize communities, celebrate certain sacraments, seek different ways to express popular devotion, and develop the multitude of gifts that the Spirit pours out in their midst. But they need the celebration of the Eucharist because it makes the church. We can even say that no Christian community is built up which does not grow from and hinge on the celebration of the Most Holy Eucharist. If we are truly convinced that this is the case, then every effort should be made to ensure that the Amazonian peoples do not lack this food of new life and the sacrament of forgiveness. So it's subtle what he's doing here, but very clear. Rather than handing down the solution from on high, Pope Francis leaves the door open for this region of the world to dialogue, debate, and find a consensus. The Synod document opens the door for one possible solution that needs to be explored alongside other alternatives. The huge difference in the current Pope's approach to the, the challenge facing the multicultural church is that he has a trust and optimism in the ability for local churches to discern the best way forward for their own life of faith. As he states in, in the exhortation, what is needed is courageous openness to the novelty of the spirit, who was always able to create something new with the inexhaustible riches of Jesus Christ. Indeed, enculturation commits the church to a difficult but necessary journey. True, this is always a slow process and that we can be overly fearful, ending up as mere onlookers as the church gradually stagnates. But let us be fearless. Let us not clip the wings of the Holy Spirit. Now, some may remember the controversy over an image of a pregnant woman that was used in prayer during services during the Synod and placed in a Roman church. The statue itself, a naked pregnant woman that was referred to as the Pachamama, uh, an Andean image of life, Mother Earth, brought to, to Rome by the participants in the Synod. Uh, this image, of course, was immediately condemned by Roman Catholic traditionalists who saw in it a pagan idol. It aroused such a reaction that uh, these images, there are several of them, were stolen from the church by Orthodox vigilantes and thrown in the Tiber. Pope Francis apologized for this lack of sensitivity after these carvings were found and restored to the church. In his exhortation after the Synod, the Pope, aware of how even religious symbols can be interpreted differently from one culture to another, perceptively wrote, let us not be quick to describe as superstition or paganism certain religious practices that arise spontaneously from the life of peoples. Rather, we ought to know how to distinguish the weed growing among the tares, for popular piety can enable us to see how the faith, once received, becomes embodied in a culture and is constantly passed on. Now, the change of an epoch in which we're living, discerned by Pope Francis and now influencing Catholic attitudes toward evangelization, tradition and the liturgical expression of faith, has opened even more widely the doors and windows of the church that had first been pried open by the Second Vatican Council. The possibility of local Christians in concert with the global church to seek to express their own life of faith using their own cultural values and symbols is being encouraged by Pope Francis. But true enculturation, moving to interculturation, opens us all to the possibility of appreciating and sharing the manifold ways in which God's spirit and God's wonderful works manifest in Jesus Christ, enrich not only the so-called young churches, but also the places where the church has been present for millennia. To be truly intercultural, we all must be willing to go beyond mere tolerance for a multicultural community, but learn from one another, sing new songs, 
and adopt ways of praying and being church that are new to us. This is a call not just for cultural harmony, but it's a call for justice. In light of the sea change taking place here in the United States over race relations uh, and the Black Lives Matter movement, I could not help but remember that back in 1988, a holy African-American woman religious, the late sister Thea Bowman, said this so well to an assembly of US Catholic bishops. And she said this, and her words are just as relevant today as they were uh, back in 1988. And she said, the quest for justice demands that I walk in ways that I never walked before, that I talk and think and pray and learn and grow in ways that are new to me. If I'm going to share faith with my brothers and sisters who are Chinese or Jamaican or South African or Winnebago Indian, could add Aboriginal, Torres Straits Islander, Vietnamese, Filipino, I've got to learn new ways, new means, new languages, new rituals, new procedures, new understandings, so I can read my brother's heart, so I can hear my sister's call, and I can live justly. In this moment of pandemic and global uncertainty, we are blessed with the Pope who is able to accompany the faithful around the world and encourage an ever more profound and eloquent Pentecost moment that will renew the face of the earth and the face of the church. The Australian Catholic Church seems to have taken up this challenge with the exciting new document, The Light from the Southern Cross, promoting co-responsible governance in the Catholic Church in Australia. In the weeks and months to come, those of us living in your antipodes will be looking south with anticipation. Thank you very much. Mark, thank you. This morning you've, you've shared with us some, some wonderful insights into the sweep of recent historical development following Vatican II in relation to how liturgy relates to culture and how official ecclesiastical positions on this topic have shifted in various ways. And you've brought us right up to date with your insightful interpretation of the most recent statements offered by Pope Francis uh, in the post-synodical apostolic exhortation on the Synod of the Amazon, Querida Amazonia, from February 2020. You have beautifully broken open Pope Francis's approach to dialogue, debate and development in today's church and noted particularly that this comes from his position of trust and openness toward the current realities of today's world and the need for enculturation as evangelization today. In exploring the nature of intercultural liturgy, you've provide us, provided us with hope um, re regarding the positive prospect of the full flowering of liturgical enculturation as it was envisaged, envisaged by the Second Vatican Council almost 60 years ago now. Thank you for generously sharing your wisdom and understanding with us today. We are most grateful. Um, I invite everybody to join me in please saying thank you to Mark in various ways virtually. We can see lots of applause going on. <laughs> thank you to everybody who has joined us today. It has been our privilege to have you join us. Um, we hope that we'll be able to offer more such opportunities in the future. Um, and we wish you all the very best in our current trying circumstances. Mark, thank you so much. Thank to all, thanks to all of you, and God bless you and your ministries. Thank you. Thank you.